summer has finally reached England. So I have myself here a GeForce 5060 Ti 16GB variant. I wonder why. And I'll be able to release the review of it tomorrow. Right now I'm only allowed to talk about the information that Nvidia have given us about it already. And because I'm terrible at knowing what I am and aren't allowed to say, at the time of recording this I haven't actually tested the card out, just in case. So if anything I say here is eerily prophetic and accurate then it's just because I'm awesome at knowing this sort of stuff. And if I'm wrong, then it'll just make it more fun to watch this video with the power of hindsight, won't it? The 5060 and 5060 Ti have been announced. How good are they? Well, it depends on how much of a premium you put on software features and on the value of Nvidia technologies like DLSS upscaling, reflex and frame gen. Without any DLSS trickery, these cards promise roughly 20% more performance than the previous generation cards do. So 20% is more than the jump from the 30 to 40 series was, but that isn't saying much because there wasn't that much of a jump there. Usually waiting two generations is enough for there to be a significant boost in performance, but this isn't the case here. If you have a 3060 or 4060 already, then there's no real point in getting a 5060 or 60 Ti unless you care heavily about frame generation, which you probably don't. Else you're forced to go up to a higher tier if you actually want better performance. Performance is one side of the equation, the other is price, and the MSRPs, at least, are very competitive for this generation, matching or beating every other generation of RTX card to date. And that's before accounting for inflation, which only grows its lead further. I think people were expecting the 8 and 16GB variants of the 5060Ti to be $399 and $499 respectively, but at $379 and $429, they're both cheaper and priced closer together than I think a lot of people were expecting which makes it good. So this makes the upsell to the 16GB model easier to swallow. Of course, whether or not they'll be available for their MSRPs is another question. This has been a problem since the 3000 series, it seems to very much depend on which country you're in. Here in England, the situation changes quite a lot. I think all cards have been at MSRP for a few minutes here or there since release, but only the 5070 has regularly been at MSRP or even below it as it is right now, while the 9070, 9070 XT and 5070 Ti all like to be out of stock at MSRP but available for a 50 to 100 pound premium. But you know what? I'm feeling hopeful the 5060 Ti can keep to its MSRP. What with there being so many older and upcoming products nipping at its heels and with the 5070 remaining above it at MSRP to keep its price down. But we'll see. I compiled this list of previous generation counterparts going all the way back to an era when I think we all considered graphics card prices to be better. And I don't want to get too bogged down in specifics here because there are no hard and fast metrics we can use to compare different generations against each other. The die size, power consumption and pricing seems to vary wildly over time. But it is interesting to know that opting for the 16GB instead of the 8 for this generation only commands a 13% price premium, compared with 25% with the 4060 Ti. Accounting for inflation, the 5060 Ti is much cheaper than the premium 60 tiered products from the 3000 and 2000 series, but bear in mind the 3060 Ti and 2060 Super were the closest in terms of performance to the 70 tier of cards that a 60 tier of card has ever managed, which could explain their higher relative prices. Comparisons to the 1060 series are interesting, mind. The 1060 also came in two VRAM variants, the full 6GB one and a cut down 3GB variant which is very much like an 8GB card these days, although this card also happened to be cut down by about 10% performance wise. Back then you'd have to spend an extra 25% to get the full 6GB model, but then it's almost like a 1060 Ti because it comes with more performance as well. So in short, it's pretty much impossible to compare like for like because what a 60 tier of card is and represents changes almost every generation, perhaps to make comparisons more difficult. So I think the pricing of these cards is very much dependent on the competition and what they're doing at the time. And what with us still waiting on AMD to announce their 9060 series of cards, we can probably expect price shifts in response to those announcements, provided they're competitive. Now let's get back to performance again. Aside from in the very ultra high end, Nvidia have been in a holding pattern for the last few generations keeping raw performance roughly the same whilst pushing DLSS features as being the reasons to upgrade. Now, to their credit, Nvidia have been very good at rolling out improvements to DLSS upscaling to their older series of cards as well, which in a way discounts the value of their newer cards. The 4000 series, for instance, handles the new Transformer models very well. 
Compare that with AMD, where if you don't have a 9070 series of card, you can't use their new FSR technologies. But at release, the 4000 series was marketed heavily by it how its frame gen could double frame rates over the 3000 series. And now with the 5000 series, they're doing it again. But I don't think people are convinced by this. The added visual smoothness from frame gen is a nice to have. It actually is. I wasn't too convinced by the standard 2x frame gen with the 4000 series because it didn't feel like enough of a leap to justify the drawbacks. But with MFG being able to produce up to 4 times the frames, being able to convert a cinematic 30fps experience into a plus 100fps one is actually really nice to have. And I can think of genuine use cases where you'd want to use it. But still, these generated frames don't drop the latency in the same way as raw horsepower would. Nvidia always promotes frame gen in conjunction with reflex to point out how low the latency is, but they never really point out it's reflex that's doing the heavy lifting here. And if anything, the frame gen component is merely adding a bit of latency to the experience again. And you don't need frame gen to still benefit from reflex. And until we get a hands-on reflex 2 for real and know whether or not it will work well with frame gen, I really don't see frame gen alone as being a convincing reason for people to upgrade their cards. And then there's the issue of VRAM. Nvidia made it very clear that their reason for providing 8GB of VRAM rather than more of it was to sell cards for the most affordable prices possible. Now I kind of see the logic here. The Radeon 6500 XT, for instance, only had 4GB of VRAM, which made it very unappealing, but did allow it to be sold for a very low price, and to remain available at those low prices. So this isn't just because less VRAM costs less, it also makes it less appealing for other use cases like AI tools and stuff like that. However, even in the gaming space, I think most people these days would rather get a more future-proof 16GB of VRAM with their card than risk their new purchase with just 8, becoming almost immediately obsolete. Nvidia argued that VRAM is just one part of a bigger equation, pointing out in their slides that the 12GB 3060 fails to beat the 8GB 4060 and 5060 cards. But of course, all this is in the past. The fear comes from what might happen in the near future, and that 8GB cards have been around for almost 10 years at this point. It's had its day. My take? If it's done in the name of affordability, then 8GB cards should be well and truly left to the sub $200 market by now. Even last year, Intel's 10 and 12GB B500 series of cards for $220 and $250 shows that more can be done, and it will be interesting to see how they fare against the $300 8GB card that Nvidia is proposing. Because sure, Nvidia's software stack is superior. But how much value does that have if their cards don't have the VRAM to pull it off? In conclusion, the RTX 5000 series is a small improvement and price drop over the two-year-old 4000 series. So the value proposition has shifted along ever so slightly, but it's getting hard to really get excited about it when so little else has changed. The raw performance looks to be a bit better. i would hold on to that as being a genuine positive. But is it two years worth better? And is it enough to offset the fact that 8GB cards will have two years less left in the tank? Older generations of RTX cards have proven to age quite well, with additional software improvements, especially to DLSS upscaling, continuing to extract more performance out of them. Which is why 8GB on these new cards is such a shame. It looks to be limiting these cards' futures, and really puts $430 as being the starting point if you're buying a new card as a long-term investment, rather than to serve as merely a stopgap. And who wants a $300 stopgap? It seems to be the case that every new generation gives us the bare minimum amount more to justify its existence, but never quite enough to get us that excited about it. If you ask me, if the cost of VRAM really is so critical to keeping a card cheap, then they could have designed the 5060 with 6 and 12 gigabytes in mind, really emphasising affordability with the 6, but having 12 as being the one that most people looking to build a new budget build would aim for. Now, I've never believed that upscaling has caused new games to be less optimised but I can see how the existence of upscaling has made VRAM a more important component in order to upsell you to higher tiers of graphics cards. And in Nvidia land, anything with more than 8GB of VRAM comes with a significant price premium. But at some point, this is going to work against them. Intel are already teasing sub $300 cards with more than 8GB of the stuff. Nvidia's 12GB RTX 5070 has been overshadowed by AMD's 16GB 9070. All it would take would be for AMD's upcoming 9060 series of cards to have 16GB of VRAM, and Nvidia's 8GB cards will suddenly look decidedly outdated.